FBI officials say they've stopped a plot to destroy Maryland energy facilities and cause major disruptions to the power grid. We'll tell you who's behind the attack. The desperate search for survivors continues in Turkey and Syria after a devastating earthquake, the latest on the searches. And Metro's new fare gates hope to tackle the fare evasion. Transportation reporter Adam Tuss shows us how they're working. And a local author won two of the most prestigious honors for children's literature. We'll talk to her about the new honors. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast for you, streaming on all of your different streaming devices. I'm Sean Yancey. We're everywhere. I'm Tommy McFly. It is February 6th. Happy Monday. Two people are charged in a plot to destroy energy facilities in Maryland in an alleged racially motivated attack. Prosecutors say Sarah Clen Daniel and Brandon Russell devised a plan to shoot five electrical substations in Baltimore. They were taken into custody last week and just released today. Investigators say Russell is the founder of a neo-Nazi group that supports the idea of lone wolf violence. The pair used encrypted chats to discuss the plan and the weapons they'd use. Prosecutors say the attack was racially motivated, and if successful, it would have paralyzed a city of nearly 600,000 people, 61 percent of whom are black. As the criminal complaint alleges, Clan Daniel and Russell conspired and took steps to shoot multiple electrical substations in the Baltimore area, aiming to, quote, completely destroy this whole city. They had extremist views, and, and, and in order to further those views, they hoped that conducting this violent act was going to bring light to that. Baltimore Gas and Electric released a statement that said service was never disrupted and there are no known current threats. BGE also said it's been working over the years to ensure security of the grids as threats increase by designing a smarter grid and using backup equipment. Now to that developing story the entire world is tracking tonight. A desperate search for survivors in a catastrophic earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Thousands of people are helping to search the rubble and more than 3,000 people are believed to have been killed. Now the images you're seeing are difficult to look at. It's also difficult to wrap your arms around the magnitude of the misery caused by this disaster. The devastating 7.8 magnitude quake hit overnight. It was so powerful, people felt it throughout the Middle East. President Biden is sending U.S. aid, including the Fairfax County Urban Search and Rescue Team. This video here is when they were deployed in September to Florida after Hurricane Ian. Their skills are sorely needed in Turkey. As NBC's Molly Hunter reports, more than 3,000 buildings are believed to have collapsed. And all of those numbers, the death toll, but also the numbers of buildings and structures, infrastructure destroyed, all of that will likely increase. Now, Turkish authorities say their focus right now is on search and rescue. We are still in that key window where search and rescue teams are looking through rubble for survivors. It is also where they're focused on for their asks from, from their international partners. So they are getting help across the EU, here in the UK and the US, all sending uh, humanitarian aid as well as search and rescue teams. So we are talking boots on the grounds. We're talking medics, rescue dogs transport aircraft. Now we have to understand that even before the earthquake in this area on the Turkish and northern Syrian border, uh, aid groups were worried about the weather, winter conditions, freezing temperatures. On the Turkish side, you have 3.6 million Syrian refugees uh, who live in that country more than any other country. Uh, there's no place for them to go. On the Syrian side, infrastructure was already incredibly fragile. We're talking makeshift camps and tents that aid organizations were already worried about how these people were going to survive uh, the next couple of brutal months. In fact, one spokesman for the International Rescue Committee called it an emergency within an emergency. But tomorrow morning when the light comes up after a whole night of rescue operations, we will certainly have a better sense of the devastation. Molly Hunter, NBC News, London. Three construction workers in Virginia had a frightening day on the job. They were working on a building in Tyson's this morning when the scaffolding lost power and began to tilt. They were about 13 stories in the air. Fairfax County Fire and Rescue crews came in to help rescue the workers. They pulled one onto a nearby balcony and pulled two others into the building through a window. Fortunately, no one was hurt. And the United States military is now working to recover debris from the suspected Chinese surveillance balloon that was shot down over the coast of South Carolina over the weekend. Navy vessels have now surrounded the wide debris field so divers and robotic underwater equipment can collect up all the pieces, any pieces of that balloon. A top military general also revealed today the balloon was similar in size to a regional jetliner weighing more than 2,000. 
thousand pounds. The size of that balloon was part of the reason why it was shot down over the Atlantic Ocean. The FBI plans to search former Vice President Mike Pence's Indiana home for more classified documents. This comes after Pence's legal team informed the National Archives last month that a small number of classified documents were found at the House. The material turned up after Mr. Pence asked his team to look for any documents following the discovery of classified records at President Biden's Delaware home. Mr. Pence's lawyers say the documents found were inadvertently boxed and transported at the end of the Trump administration. Well, Metro is rolling out new, taller, more restrictive fare gates to try to cut down on the amount of fare evasion within the system. And we're checking them out. I mean, we're not checking out the new gates, but we are seeing if they work. Transportation reporter Adam Tuss is in Fort Totten Station with those details. Even with Metro's well-announced fare enforcement campaign, you still see riders jumping the gates over and over and over and over again. But a new, less penetrable fare gate has entered the discussion. Metro's rolled out these new swinging door plexiglass gates here at Fort Totten. Yeah, well, Metro's been trying a number of different designs with their fare gates. These ones here with the clear arches, they were installed in November. They're really not doing too much to prevent people from jumping over the fare gates. But these new swinging plexiglass gates just installed last week, they might be having a different effect. Watch as this rider tries to push through these new taller gates, but can't. That same rider did, however, wait to casually walk through with a family a short time later. Some riders, like Janet Terry, say fair evasion will always be an issue. I see it all the time. You know, even with transit police standing out here, they still will do it in front of transit police. So, you know, they don't, they don't care. The, the plastic guard wasn't worth the time. Speaking of enforcement, the News 4i team continues to keep tabs on the number of Metro fare evasion tickets. There have only been 179 tickets written since Metro announced its fare evasion crackdown in November. That equals less than two tickets per day across the entire system. And only 11 of those tickets have been written in D.C., where many riders say they see plenty of fare evasion. It's a big deal, but what can you do? You know what I'm saying? You can't make them, you know, pay. You can't stop them. You see what be going on now, so you ain't going to approach them, right? Yeah. So you give or take. It is what it is. Metro's leader stressing that only a transit police officer should get involved in a fare dispute. Do you think this will lead to more confrontation on the transit system? Uh, we certainly hope not. Uh, the other thing that we want to clear up is a station manager and a bus operator. They're not supposed to actually confront someone for a fare. As for these new swinging door gates, Metro says they're just prototypes right now to gather more information. At Fort Totten, Adam Tuss, News 4. And movie ticket prices are changing depending on where you sit. We're learning more about AMC Theater's plan to model their strategy of seating, kind of like concerts and plays and sporting events. It comes as the industry of movies and theaters is coming, uh, trying to boost their revenue. AMC announced three different tiers of seats at participating locations, standard, value, and preferred sightline. The new pricing applies only to movies after 4 o'clock, and it does not apply to Tuesdays, which apparently are Discounted ticket days. I feel like next it'll be like the you'll have to pay more for the row with more leg room, mm -hmm. like an airplane. <laughs> the premium economy of the movie theater? Yes, that's what's going to happen. All right. An author from Arlington recently won two of the highest honors in children's literature. Amini Lukman Dawson's novel's Free Water is about two enslaved siblings who escape to freedom. And News 4's Amy Cho spoke with her about her award winning book that was 20 years in the making. First of all, it's the first book I've gotten with the seal, the Newberry seal on it. An incredible honor given to the best children's book of the year. For Newberry Medal winner Amina Lukman Dawson, it's also the first novel she's ever written. I was just overwhelmed, and I'm still truly overwhelmed. Like, I, like I'm still pinching myself that this has happened. Last week, she also won the Coretta Scott King Award for outstanding books on African American culture. Her book, Free Water, is about two enslaved siblings who escape to a sanctuary, then go back to the plantation to rescue their mom. Enslavement and the history of it in this country, it's, it's hard for folks. It's, it's a lot of people, I think, fear learning about it or feel awkward with the topic. Luke Mon Dawson says she wanted to share that history with kids, like her own son, Zach. They took a research trip to the Great Dismal Swamp in Southern Virginia, which was once a real life sanctuary for enslaved people. If we can find a way to take a reading tool and wash away all that feeling of fear and awkwardness for children and actually allow them to enjoy and be excited about this history, 
then that's that's the, a goal met. Her background is in policy and nonprofits. She also worked as a substitute teacher to give herself time to write. These days, she's in high demand at local schools and book festivals. I felt as though, wow, people are not have read the book, have loved the book, and now I'm getting this recognition that will in, ensure that kids everywhere will have a chance to access this knowledge. Each page filled with purpose as this author enters the next chapter of her writing career. Amy Cho, News 4. Thanks, Amy. And Luke Mendoza is already working on her second novel, a spinoff from one of the characters in Free Water. And we certainly wish her well. Mm. A reminder, you can catch NBC4 News and weather updates anytime on Roku and Samsung TV+. Plus. Head to your device's live TV section and look for NBC Washington, D.C. News. Find us on Channel 138 on Roku and Channel 1035 on Samsung TV+. Plus. Hope you got that. And that'll do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Sean Yancey. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a good one.